May 8th, 2021, South Beach Gospel Saturday. What we're doing out here um, is preaching the gospel and passing out tracts and evangelizing this part of the world the time that we have left. So uh, for those of you that have not yet subscribed to South Beach Gospel Ministries YouTube page, you can go to YouTube, South Beach Gospel Ministries, um, and we're also on Facebook under the same name, South Beach Gospel Ministries. So, what we're doing today is we're going to look at what I call Jesus, the second man, the last Adam, which is a passage taken from uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, and uh, a description of Jesus as the person who makes up and replaces the fall of the original Adam, the original Adam being the person that God created and put in the garden. And subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So man, in the in the form of this created individual Adam, was over the earth on behalf of God. And it was this headship authority that we see being established right there in Genesis chapter one. Um, we looked a few weeks ago uh, at human genetic engineering and whether or not that's consistent with the Bible and we'll have an ongoing series on that and when we look at the second part of that which will probably come up within the next week or so we're going to take a look at Genesis chapter 1 in that context but uh, for right now uh, God says you know bring forth replenish the earth fill the earth with little people little human beings so we go on to Genesis chapter 2 and again remember here's our 7,000 year Bible prophecy timeline chart. We kind of looked at that last week and again on Thursday night we looked at that a little more in detail for those of you that haven't seen it and our uh, Thursday night house church teaching which is now on YouTube. We looked at the seven epics or time phrase frames of human history each divided out into a 1,000 year day in God's eyes. So you have six days of work, one day of rest, then you have the millennial reign of Christ and after that eternity. But in the beginning here, all the way at the end of our timeline chart, we see one around that right here in Genesis chapter 2, men get, man gets responsibility for rulership over the earth and we pick it up. Verse 7, and God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So what we find out then is that when God created the body of Adam, it was just a clay mannequin made of the elements of the earth. It wasn't until God breathed into him the breath of life that he became a living soul, the Bible says. And so we are distinguished from all the other creatures that dwell upon the earth that are made from the earth, made from the waters, the Bible says, uh, for some of the creatures. None of them have that we are created in the image of God. 
good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. And the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So God gave Adam a direct command, and the Lord said, you know, this is what you're supposed to do. It was very clear. Adam didn't say, I don't understand, you know, what translation is that? We're going to need an interpreter. He understood what God was saying. The very next verse, we find out that God introduces a new character onto the scene, the woman. God says, and the Lord God said, it's not good for man that he should be alone. And I will make him and help meet for him, meaning appropriate for him. So what did God do? Verse 19, it says, and out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, the fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called him, every living creature, that was the name thereof. So it was Adam, not Adam and Eve, but Adam himself that named all the creatures, that God brought the creatures to, so that to see what Adam would choose to use the intellect that God gave him to name these different creatures. And so it was clear that God had this special relationship with Adam that was separate and apart from Eve who had not yet been created. And it was Adam, the man, that was the headship principle, the caretaker of the planet Earth on behalf of God. And that will end up being important as we get sort of that same headship principle in the human family, um, even up to this day, even though now that's, you know, under assault. Um, and so, it goes on to say, verse 21, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he, God, took one of Adam's ribs and closed up the flesh thereof instead. Verse 22, and it says, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, from that he made a woman and brought her unto the man. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman, brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken from out of the man. So God then institutes this principle of marriage and separation of a child from their family to be with their husband and or wife. And it says, verse 24, and therefore a man, therefore shall a man leave his fa father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall become one flesh. So the principle of marriage to one woman by one man is introduced in the Bible. So the concept of one man, one woman, marriage, they cleave to each other, they know each other sexually, and then they produce kids. That's the family principle that God created and instituted. And so, to the extent that it's changed later by the rules of man, we can have ourselves the original template for the human family, one man, one wife, together, raising a family. And, you know, you would leave your mother and your father, unite yourself to that one other person, and that's how God wanted it be done. And interestingly enough, chapter 2 ends with verse 25. It says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife. Now Eve is his wife. And they were not ashamed. They had no reason to be ashamed because they were innocent and sin free until we get to the very next chapter. And here we are, Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man. It starts with the fall of the woman. But because the man was the one in charge, the headship
Jesus Christ is the head of the man. God is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. Man is the head of the human family. And, you know, uh, God is the head of all. So, that principle is laid out pretty clearly, but yet we see it being shifted and under attack in modern day culture. And there's a reason for that because we find out now that Separating ourselves from the will of God, from what began with the command of God to Adam in the Garden of Eden, all the way through to where we're at here today, right here at the end of the church era. We're here in the land of sin, sort of last days era of the apostate church, which will then end when the rapture occurs. We go to the Father's house in heaven, 70th week of Daniel. which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Now the serpent, which is really Satan, hiding behind the serpent talking, you know, calls God a liar. And he comes out and he says, ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then, your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And that's kind of true, though we didn't tell her the bad part. Yeah, her eyes would be open, and she would be as God, knowing good and evil. But the knowledge of the evil will corrupt her and cause her to be forever separated from God, which would require the imprisonment of anyone in that condition to be placed in the lake of fire at the end of time. Now, Satan didn't bother to tell her that little point about this little area right here. He kind of left that part out. The best lies are the ones that incorporate some truth in it. If you have some truth, it's easier to shop the lie. So, again, he left out the part about an eternal separation from God in the lake of fire, which we find out that is absolutely mentioned in every one of the Gospels and was one of the topics that Jesus hit upon again and again and again hell and damnation is part of the whole salvation equation. You can't have salvation without having damnation first. And so, okay, so we get back into Genesis chapter 3, and so the serpent says, you shall not surely die, for God doth know in the day ye there of your eyes shall be open, knowing good and evil. So she buys into this half-truth, and then we get to verse 6, and what happens? She says, and the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and it was a treat desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So we find out that who was the one that was under deception? Paul makes it clear several centuries later that it was the woman that was in deception. It was the woman that believed the lie of the serpent, that goddesshood, which was really a type of feminism in its very earliest nascent stages, Women can be on top now. 
God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob chose the man to be the ruler, but the serpent said, you need top billing. You, you need your name on the marquee too. So eat of this fruit, get your husband to do it too, because he won't talk to me, and then you can be a goddess. And sure enough, she saw that the tree was good for food, beautiful to the eye, but was also desirable to make one wise. And that's why women who are involved in the cult practice of Wicca have adopted that name. It's sort of an old English term for wisdom, the wise ones, the wizened ones, Wicca. That relates back to what we find right here in Genesis chapter 3 where Eve became, you know, controversially enough, the very first Wiccan, the very first witch, the very first occultic practitioner who wanted to obtain goddesshood through the use of the occult. Occult just means hidden. Occult knowledge means hidden knowledge. God wanted to hide the knowledge of evil from them, so necessarily the knowledge of good and evil was something that God wanted to hide from Adam and Eve. Not because he wanted to cheat them out of something good, but because he knew that their innocence would be lost. And so the terrible, terrible part of the deal was that in order for her to obtain her goddesshood, she would have to get her husband to go along with her. Because Lucifer, serpent, Satan could not get Adam to do the, the dirty deed and betray God. So she gets him to do it. And we find out later, Paul makes that clear very centuries later, that it wasn't Eve that was, it wasn't Adam that was deceived, but rather it was Eve. Adam did it because he wanted to please his wife. And so the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They, they, they realized after they obtained the knowledge of good and evil that they were naked and they were ashamed. And so now they realized that they had lost their innocence and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves. Steve, how terrible. For the first time ever, Adam and Eve had to hide from God. That concept, that thought never crossed their minds until this very day after they partook of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. And they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. How sad and pathetic. When I think about this, every time I think of it, it's, it almost brings tears to the eyes when you think of Adam and Eve, heretofore innocent children who would interact, interface, and have communion with the Lord face to face every day at the end of the day in the garden are now hiding behind the palm tree. You know, kind of, is that, there he is. Oh, just, shh, be quiet. And maybe he'll just walk by and you won't notice that we're here. And the Lord God called unto Adam. No, notice when God, he gets to the scene, he already knows what's happening because God stands out of the space-time continuum. So we find out from, you know, Genesis chapter one, that the Trinity obviously is the truth because God says, let us create man in our image according to our likeness in Genesis chapter one. So God is outside the space-time continuum. So before Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Holy Spirit were all existent in what we call eternity past here on our diagram. So you would have Lucifer existing in eternity past as the anointed cherub that covereth God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all existing before the creation of the planet Earth and the Garden of Eden and the Fall. So they are like the Goodyear blimp above the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. From that vantage point, you can see the beginning, the middle, and the end all at the same time. And so God knew what was going to happen. So when he went to the garden that day and said, Adam, where art thou? He didn't ask because he didn't know. He was asking because it was a rhetorical question to teach Adam and to teach us who would read about Adam in the years thereafter uh, the, the terrible price of sin. But notice again, because of the headship principle where God placed Adam at the head of the human family, there, therefore the head of the human race, it was Adam, the guy in charge, that gets called on the carpet. So when God shows up, he doesn't say, Adam and Eve, where are you? Eve, where are you? He says, Adam. And Adam gets called out. 
Adam gets called into the principal's office by himself. Even though it's like, but wait, my wife was in on the caper too. How, how come she's not getting called in? Because she wasn't in charge. And so that's, that's you know, a weighty responsibility for you fellas out there. Um, yeah, you've got, you've got more uh, authority, but you also have more responsibility, and you also have greater culpability for the fall of the human race and the destruction of the family. When the family falls into disrepair, it's the husband's fault because the husband was the guy that was in charge and the guy that God is going to hold responsible for what happens to the, uh, the entire family. So on a microcosmic scale, all you men out there, you know, once you get born again and believe the gospel, then the next thing you need to do, if you're going to have a family get married, is be a responsible father because God's going to hold you to a higher standard of accountability than he's going to hold the wife or the daughters or the sons that you produce because you're the guy that was supposed to be in charge implementing the will of God on a microcosmic scale called the, 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 the nuclear family as a type of the macrocosmic scale of the macrocosmic human family known as the human race. And so we move on. God says, Adam, where art thou? And in verse 10 and 11, Adam says, you know, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God asked him, he says, wait a minute, who told you that you were naked? How did you even know the concept of nakedness? You didn't know anything about that. Hast thou eaten up the tree? Where have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And again, now remember, God already knows that this tree that Adam and Eve have eaten up, he already knew this. He wasn't asking because he didn't know. He was asking them because he was using this as a rhetorical tool to teach a concept to Adam and Adam to teach all of us the concept. And the concept he laid out was clear. He says, Adam says, well, the woman that thou gave to me, in other words, it's kind of your fault. You gave me this woman. She gave me of the fruit. Right? I, everything was going swimmingly. You know, I was watching college football, go golfing, you know, and it, until you put the woman into the program. So Adam is kind of shading a little bit. God kind of saying, well, you might have made a mistake here and give me this woman. But but you, you notice, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's really interesting when you, when you look at it. It says, who told you we were naked? He says, the woman thou gavest, she gave to me, and I did eat. Adam doesn't say anything about the serpent deceiving him or cajoling him or offering him because the serpent's interactions was directly with Eve, with his wife. Hey, how are you? And, God bless you. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. The wrong way. No, that's all right. It's live TV, so you're famous now. You're YouTube famous. God bless. So, here we are. You know, we got all the denizens of South Beach. Uh, coming right in on our, our live uh, studio audience. Uh, we had uh, someone who was trying to avoid, you know, cutting off the camera, but went the wrong way. So anyway, again, the woman, and that was a perfect example. Of woman. That's kind of our Eve for the day. Eve just walked across the set. Thank you, Lord. Um, so Adam doesn't, you know, say anything about the serpent deceiving him, but Adam does mention the woman. Well, I ate it because the woman told me to do it. Gave me the woman, and so it's your fault. And so God then turns over to Eve, and the Lord God says unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? Not because he didn't know, he knew what she had done. He was asking her a rhetorical question so she could think about what it is that she had done, and so that we could all, centuries later, think about what she had done. And said, Well, serpent beguiled me and I did eat. So, oh, that's where each deception came in. I got tricked by the most wise and crafty creature in all of the Garden of Eden on all of the planet Earth and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, now in verse 14 of Genesis chapter 3, because thou hast done this, what? Deceived he and caused her to seduce her husband and to sin. Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thou shalt eat dust all the days of thy life. And then, in the very next verse, we get the very first proto-evangelion, the very first reference to the gospel, 
and that is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, so I don't know if both of you that are Bible students at home, for your triple suit game, the very first Bible prophecy ever recorded in Scripture, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that predicts the coming of the Messiah as a virgin-born God-man would crush Satan, who was in the form of the serpent, and here it is, verse 15, it says, and I, God, will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed, serpent, and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It, it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel, is a metaphorical reference to an event that will come millennia later, where Jesus will be crucified on the cross. I think right here on our timeline, here's the fall, here's where God is saying all these things. The actual fulfillment of that prophecy doesn't occur until what? Some four centuries later. That messianic prophecy was 4,000 years old when Jesus died on the cross. The oldest prophecy in the Bible, and separate apart from the prophecy of Daniel and the 69 weeks and years, that's one of the most amazing prophecies in the Bible because it's so old. It was made here in the Garden of Eden, and it wasn't fulfilled until we get all the way over to here, 4,000 years later, of Jesus on Nisan 14 of 32 AD, which we talked about at length during our Holy Week uh, you know, series of videos, um, which you can find on YouTube. So those of you that are into that goal, we talk in great detail about how the 69 weeks of Daniel predicted Jesus would appear, present himself for crucifixion, 483 years to the day in advance, and it did happen on that very same day. But it's even more to prevent that prophecy from coming true. And that's what the Babylonian captivity, which we have depicted kind of right here, and the Assyrian captivity, as well as the Egyptian captivity, all of these strange intrigues against God's people, the Jews, were really Satan's attempt to frustrate or foil the Proto-Evangelium, the Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 prediction that the virgin-born God-man would come at a space and time un, as, as yet unknown to crush the head of the serpent and defeat him. So Satan failed in those attempts. And now we move on. Verse 16, God says to the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Thy sorrow shall thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be towards thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So here we have kind of the prediction that as a result, of the intrigue between the serpent and Eve in Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 through 6 God is predicting right here in verse 16 that feminism will become part and parcel of Satan's trade and practice in interacting with females and you know it's it's sort of like you know uh, you use football as an analogy I used to play football you know in high school and college and all kinds of stuff and I like to use you know, if you're the offensive coordinator and you see that, you know, Bo Schimbeckler used to say when he was coaching at Michigan, you know, turn, turn around, hand the ball off to the tailback, and you're gaining, you know, a 600 yards rushing the game and you're winning 70 to nothing, you know, people say, well, you're so predictable and your offense is so staid. It's like, well, if it works, you don't change it. So if turning around and handing the ball off to the tailback and running him into the line of scrimmage, get you to win the game every week, 70 to nothing, then you keep doing that until they stop you. And that same tactic is the one that we find Satan actually applying um, from the fall in the garden of Eden all the way through. If I can't get to the man who's too stubborn to work with me, I'll get to the woman, seduce her with promises of elevation of her status above the second position in the human family, which he Satan convinces the woman is second class citizenship because your second position doesn't mean you're second class and importance in God's eyes. It just means you're at the second position. You got the captain at position one, and then you got the wife who is the first mate at position two, and then you have the kids 
at position three. It doesn't mean that the kids are less important than the mother or the father. It just means that's the position that they occupy in the nuclear human family. And so Satan convinced Eve that her position in the kingdom of God's world here on the planet Earth and in the Garden of Eden was inferior or second class to the man's. And therefore she needed to take up the occultic tree of the knowledge of good and evil to elevate herself to goddesshood so that she could have position number one, which would be more desirable for her. And so God is saying in Genesis chapter three, verse 16, that this same zeitgeist or this mindset that Eve adopted from the serpent would be passed along to all of the daughters of Eve. All of the women that are born of Eve would inherit through, I guess, the mitochondrial DNA passed from mother to daughter, you know, from time immemorial. They would inherit that same desire to be on top. And I think that's what we see God describing here. He's saying, in childbirth, you're gonna have pain and suffering because of what you did with regard to getting your husband to go along with the satanic plan. And you're also gonna have an inherent desire to rule over him. When you look at the Hebrew word there, that, that, that really is saying that, he's saying to Eve, that you and all of your daughters born thereafter will have a desire to dominate over the man, but he's gonna rule over you. So God is insisting here that he's gonna keep man in position one in the headship of the tripartite human nuclear family. You know, the, uh, the husband on top, the, you know, the wife beneath his authority and the children beneath their authority together. But God over all of them, um, that's the, the model that, that is set up and what we see here in the garden. Now, Adam gets called on the carpet, but notice, even though he gets top billing as the head of the human family, he also gets the worst punishment separate and apart from, from Satan himself, he gets responsibility for the curse that is now going to be placed on the entire universe. And Adam, not Eve, will get responsibility, culpability for every human and animal death that will ever occur from the fall in the garden all the way through to the end of the millennial reign of Christ. And yes, some people will die in the millennial reign of Christ because we'll have human beings go into the millennium in human bodies, but very few will die. It says, if you die at 100, you'll still be considered a child during the millennial reign of Christ, which will extend out for a thousand years. The longevity of the human race that existed before the flood of Noah, which we have depicted right here, will be again returned so that if a kid dies, he'll be 100 years old. So everybody else is gonna live to be closer to a thousand years, just like it was for the flood of Noah. So what we find out then is that yes, all the way through this epoch of time, every human being and every animal that ever dies throughout this 7,000 year period of time will be held accountable or attributable to the first man, the original Adam, because of his failure, the curse of sin comes upon the whole universe and every human that is ever born has to die. That's a pretty that's a pretty heavy burden to have thrown on your shoulders there, Steve, and that's exactly what God did. Notice he didn't say that to Eve. He gave her a tummy ache during childbirth and uh, her requirement to be, uh, if not subservient, but under the authority or rule or control of her husband in the human family so that he has to make the decision because he's the guy that's going to be held responsible for it. So to Adam, God says this, he says, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, of all of the earth. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So Adam's gonna feel heartache and sorrow. The land is cursed. Before, fruit was growing out of every tree everywhere. You know, he had the whole garden of Eden, which is an incredible panoply of different fruits and vegetables and things to eat. And now, it won't give forth its fruit easily. The earth is cursed. Now Adam's gonna have to work and toil and struggle at it to get enough food to eat. And it says, 
curse is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Both thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And so Adam is held responsible for death. The fact that we have to toil and struggle, you know, farmers can't just buy a plot of land and sit back and watch the crops grow. No, he's got to buy a tractor, he's got to buy animals, he's got to go plow the field, he's got to put seeds in, he's got to water it, he's got to make sure the crops are harvested before winter time comes. He's got to do all of this work that makes the life of a farmer one of toil, struggle, and hard work from before sunrise until sundown. And that's been that way forever, and that's how, how it, it continues to be because of Adam's fall in the garden, because Adam was the first man, because Adam was the guy that held the responsibility, rulership, leadership, and control of the earth on behalf of God. His failure as cataclysmic, exponentially disastrous effects upon the entire planet Earth and the greater cosmos, the second law of thermodynamics, the law of cosmic entropy that Einstein you know, opined about, is as a result of this fall in the garden. You know, that the universe, like a clock is winding down, is a principle of uh, astrophysics. It is unquestionable that everything in the universe is winding down towards what astrophysicists refer to as heat death of the universe. When energy gets to the point where it becomes less and less usable, to the point that no more heat radiation from the stars, everything will cool down, motion will cease to occur, and the universe itself will experience a heat death, will freeze over. Were it not for the fact that God's got to intervene long before that happens, it would happen. But that's the second law of thermodynamics, cosmic entropy. Everything in the universe is winding down to less and less usefulness to the point where it won't be useful at all, and it won't be able to sustain life anywhere in the universe, including on the planet Earth. And so, as a result, God had to uh, kill an animal to make coats of skin to clothe them. So Adam and Eve, we see here in the Garden of Eden, we see the principle of the blood atonement that Paul talks about in Hebrews chapter 10. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. We find that principle being applied for the first time right here in the Garden of Eden, or rather I should say right here in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse uh, you know, uh, 21, 22, and 23, see God killing an innocent animal to clothe them as a symbolic gesture for what his son Jesus, who would be the second man and the last Adam, would later have to do. And so, uh, verse 20, it says, Adam, uh, called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living and uh, again God kills this animal he clothes them and then in verse 22 the Lord God said behold the man has become as one of us it's God the Father talking to God the Son and God the Holy Spirit he's not talking to the, the us isn't referring to the angels fallen or unfallen it's talking about God the Father God the Son God the Holy Spirit all of whom existed outside the space-time continuum before even the first of the angels were ever created. So it's not the serpent, Job's witnesses are wrong, Jesus is not the Archangel Michael. Long before the Archangel Michael was created, Jesus already pre-existed with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And so, what we find out then is that God says to his Trinity, behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Now, the angels didn't know good and evil, you know, it was God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that knew good and evil, so the us must be making reference to God, not the angels. And so, he says, man has become uh, uh, as one of us knowing good and evil. Now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, then we gotta kick him out of the garden. So here you have that, that tree of life was also in the garden with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life would make its reappearance uh, several centuries later here when the new Jerusalem God comes down down from heaven we'll see that the tree of life that originally appeared in the garden of Eden here will appear some 7,000 years later here in the new Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven which will be the eternal dwelling 
the place of the church with Jesus Christ. And so, God is saying, we got to kick them out of the garden, lest they take forth of the tree of life and obtain for themselves eternal life in a fallen state, which will cause them to necessarily have to share the same fate that the fallen angels, Satan, the anointed chair of the cover, they're going to have to spend eternity in hell here because they are eternal beings. They can't die. They don't get old. They don't wear out. They're going to continue to exist forever in their fallen state, these fallen angels. And to prevent man from falling into that same trap, God kicks him out of the garden and then puts a guard up so that man cannot obtain eternal life. So when we hear scientists today talking about using CRISPR-Cas9 genetic engineering tool in the search for the evolutionary advancement of man and the opportunity to find what they're really looking for is a scientifically established and manifested form of eternal life. Even if they were able to accomplish that very goal, and there's some argument in the book of Revelation, there's some unusual uh, chapters there that would suggest that maybe they do unlock the code uh, for perpetuating the human body's existence related to telomeres and cells. We'll talk about that in our, uh, again, upcoming series on human genetic engineering and the Bible. Uh, but again, God says that eternal life, apart from the grace of God, would be torment. It would be condemnation. It would require them to be warehoused away with a cancerous form of spiritual decrepitness called sin and it spreads and it infects and destroys and a cancer cell you know as, as I understand from cellular biologists is a cell that replicates forever and ever and ever and it never ceases to stop growing and that's what eventually kills the host the host is killed because the cancer cell want to take over everything and it makes the tumor that it lives in bigger and bigger and bigger until it kills off the host and so what we find out is that God doesn't want that to happen to the human race. He doesn't want it to happen to Adam because then every one of his children would be eternal, wouldn't they? They wouldn't have these limited time clocks. Thank goodness I have a limited time clock, Steve. Because I don't want to be stuck here in this fallen world in my fallen body forever and ever. I want to only have to deal with it for a certain amount of time. And thankfully, according to the Bible, we only have to deal with it for 70 years or so, or 80 years if by great strength. And of course, there are people like my aunt, my great grandmother, you know, who made it beyond that period of time. But as a general rule, we're kind of limited to around 70 to 80 years. And we'll talk about that time frame as we talk about the rapture and our coming up, upcoming special teaching on the rapture, which is coming next week. Don't miss that. Stay tuned for that one. But what we find out then is that God, in his infinite mercy and wisdom, kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden to pick it sort of right here so that they won't be tempted by Satan to take of the tree of life and become eternal. Eternal life, man. You know, that's what everybody wants to find. But they want to find it without Jesus Christ. So they're turning to biological science and human genetic engineering to try to bootstrap or backdoor the condemnation of God for our fall in the garden and our casting us out of the garden to prevent us from accessing eternal life, now we're going to turn to biological science and human genetic engineering to reobtain that which God in his infinite wisdom is withholding from us. Not because he's selfish, but because he knows in our fallen state to live eternally in this state would require us to be condemned forever. And he doesn't want us to be condemned. So God is actually being loving and merciful. And that raises yet another specter about the ethics of the idea of human genetic engineering. Trying to make man better and better and better. Eventually, until he doesn't even die anymore. A whole new race of humans that won't die. Again, is that consistent with what the Bible teaches? It isn't. Even though it may be consistent with what some bioethicists say, oh, this is okay, you know, you're not hurting, you know, animals in, in, in the practice of obtaining eternal life, so therefore it's ethical. That's another issue for another teaching which is coming up. But now we see, again, they're, they're kicked out of the garden, and it says, so God drove the man out of the garden, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden, 
That's where that book title comes. East of Eden, wasn't that a famous book and movie? Um, he places at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So we find out that that man is cast out of the garden as a result of God's attempt to protect us from destroying ourselves, Steve. Sometimes we would be so enamored of the woman when he, you know, offers, you know, her beauty and her uh, you know, companionship and says, honey, I want this. Sometimes as men, we go along with it even though we know better because so powerful is the draw of the allure of the beautiful woman to the man because man realizes he's missing something that once upon a time he had and what was that thing well when you look at genesis chapter 2 you find out that adam was actually put to sleep and god took a rib from out of his side and made from that a woman and brought her to the man and adam was like oh it's gonna be my wife oh this is wonderful so you know that's not just metaphorical Biology. That's actual, literal, anatomical surgery. God created the woman out of the rib of the man. So whenever a man looks at a woman, he's attracted to her. It isn't just because she has long, beautiful hair, or because she, you know she's got a shapely figure or whatever. There is something on a cosmic, spiritual level that the man perceives that is a part of me in some special metaphysical way. And that's something that used to be a part of me that has been taken out of me. And now, that's my missing piece. And I think God did it that way on purpose. God could have snapped his finger and made a woman appear, couldn't he? Or he could have reached down to the same dirt that he made Adam out of and blown into her mouth and made her a little... But no, he intentionally put Adam to sleep, performed surgery on him, pulled out a rib, and fashioned from the rib a woman. That's, that's, that, now that's real human genetic engineering. I would prefer to leave the human genetic engineering of the human race in the future to the guy who did it in the beginning, God, rather than uh, relying upon whether it be you know, the professor over the University of California, uh, Berkeley, Jennifer Nuna, who just won the uh, Nobel Prize for you know this CRISPR Cas9 thing. I would rather rely upon God doing any human genetic engineering in the future than rely upon a geneticist or biologist or, you know, some guy in a laboratory, or a woman in a laboratory, for that matter. But again, so what we find out is that God then, uh, again, that, that explains the, the un incalculable attraction of the man for the woman. The man perceives that the woman was taken from out of him, and that's the missing piece that he no longer has. So Steve, as nice as you are, I don't have the same, you know, ideation and attraction for you as because, you know, man was meant and built to be attracted to the woman and the woman to the man. So again, the human family, the nuclear family, is laid out for us. Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, we see that plainly. And so we go, on, we go to Exodus chapter 12, we talked about this at length, we won't take a lot of time talking about it. But in Exodus chapter 12, we see that whole institution of the Passover sacrifice for the nation of Israel when they were in captivity in Egypt last night of captivity, but we find out that God said, take the Passover lamb, kill the lamb on Nisan 14, put blood on the door of your house in the form of a cross, and when I send the destroyer through the land, I'll see the blood on the door, and I will pass over you, do not allow the destroyer to come in and destroy you. And again, we see that in Exodus 12,
it out. We won't spend time on that because we looked at that at length before. But now we jump into the, uh, you know, the very last of the Old Testament passages I want to look at today. And we look at Isaiah chapter 7. What do we find out? In about 800 B.C., that's about 800 years before Jesus comes into the world, we find out that Isaiah the prophet is being part of that very first messianic prophecy of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Um, and it's found in Genesis chapter 7, verse 14. It says, Therefore, the Lord shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall call his name Emmanuel. Again, that relates to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, where God used the strange term of seed or zera, woman, seed of the woman. Women don't have seed. The Hebrew word zera makes reference to spermatozoa. Only men have that. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 is clearly saying that it will be a virgin born God man that will crush the head of the serpent because no man's genetic material will be involved in the birthing of this God man brought into the world. And so we find out then that Isaiah and Isaiah 7:14 extrapolates on that a little bit more and makes clear that this entity will be born of a virgin and he'll be called Emmanuel. And you can say, her, but wait, uh, yeah, Emmanuel, that's not the name of the Messiah. Jesus is his name. So he must be talking about somebody else. No, Emmanuel is the uh is the title the title oh, 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 hold on. no i i'm actually in the middle of a teaching i don't know you see this is live tv who he's talking to uh, i'm walking past south beach this walking look at this guy my man. woman got a starbucks and i see this guy talking just to himself so i'm trying to figure out what's going on we're preaching the gospel telling people about jesus and how to be saved i see you got a cross on there see look at this guy wearing crosses but does he know what that cross symbolizes that cross symbolizes the virgin born God man that I'm in the process of telling you guys about dying on one of these about 2,000 years ago so that the second man, yes, this Jesus Christ, yes, can allow us to get into heaven free of charge. That's what all these little symbols that he's wearing. See, he's got a bunch of them. So and he knows inherently lying. in his heart. And the reason why I got important. a lot of them, because I'm a Christian. I believe in all this stuff. So, so, so you know, yeah. I need protected too. You so, understand what so, I'm saying? Well, I think, what's your name? My name is Rick. Good looking guy, this guy, Rick and his girlfriend. Where, where are you from, Rick? I'm from um, actually Kentucky, Erlinger, Kentucky. This guy's from Erlinger, yeah. Kentucky, Ann Arbor, Michigan. This so, is love? Yeah, it is. Oh, so, so that's the seat. So, I'm sorry so, to mess up no, that's okay. Head. It's not messed up because, see, this is what real evangelism is. This is what Paul did, except he didn't have a, a camera. You go out to where the people are and you meet the people where they are. So, yes, we sir. thank you for giving us your testimony here today and allowing me to use this prop because we were right there talking about the virgin born God man who would have to die on one of these implements. So you see right there, that's the cross that we've been talking about all day. And he's got a bunch of them. In fact, we got like a little bit of a depiction here. And there you see it. There's the depiction of what would occur some 4,000 years after it was first prophesied in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Because he died The virgin born God man who died. See, there's a biblically literate man. Thank I'm you. encouraged today being here on South Beach by incredible people. Yeah, go uh, South Beach Gospel Ministries. So, uh, again, it's live TV, boys and girls. You never know. Uh, yeah. You never know what happens. You gotta be think on your feet. So anyway, all right. So what we find out then is that yes, the virgin-born God-Man was predicted by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter seven, verse fourteen. Now we jump into Matthew chapter one, and we'll find out. See the time we have left. We got we got enough time to get through this. We find out then in Matthew chapter one. Guess what? Now we're fast forwarding some eight hundred years into the future from Isaiah chapter seven, which was itself about. Uh, 3,300 years after the fall in the garden, we get now to uh, Matthew chapter 1. Now we begin the New Testament, and it says here, verse 20, And an angel of the Lord appeared and said unto Joseph, Joseph, take thy son, excuse me, Joseph, thy son David, meaning that he's a descendant of, of King David uh, in the Old Testament. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost, and he shall bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Jesus. And again, you say, well, wait a minute. Now, Herbert, did you said that Isaiah said the guy's name would be Emmanuel. I said, no, his title would be Emmanuel. But then that's when our, our dear friend from Kentucky came in. And what I was saying is that 
the Hebrew term Iman I, Iman U El is a title of description. It means God is with us, or literally with us, Imanu El, God. With us is God. That was the title of the virgin born God man. That's how you know he wasn't just a man born of a virgin, which in and of itself would be miraculous, but that this man born of a virgin would also have to be deity. God in human flesh. Why? Because Isaiah makes clear that what we were talking about originally in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says, the virgin born man will also be God because his title will be Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us or with us, God. Now we fast forward 800 years to Matthew chapter 1 and we find out that the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph whose wife, Mary, is pregnant, but he's never had sex with her. She's still a virgin, and he's confused. He wants to maybe break off the marriage uh, contract, the engagement. And the angel says, no, no, God said to marry her. She's gonna bring forth her son, and she shall call his name Jesus. That's his literal name, not, not just his title. His name will be called Jesus, which literally means Yahweh is the savior, so you take Emmanuel, God with us, combine that with Jesus, Jehovah or Yahweh is the Savior, which proves that Jesus is both a man, born of a virgin, but he's also God, he's also Yahweh, he's the God of the Old Testament. It says, he shall call his name Jesus, so he, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's why he's called Jesus, because Jesus is Yahweh the Savior. Verse 22, and it says, now this was d done that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and she shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is interpreted God with us. So we find right there in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, a clarification just for confirmation. It's not just her about here, just sharing his opinion with people. It's a confirmation. Isaiah 7, 14 was referring to the virgin-born God-man, who would be called titularly, how's that for a word? Emmanuel, uh, but his literal name would be Jesus, which means Yahweh is the Savior. And so, as a result of that, that is because of the fall in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Now we'll jump forward to Matthew chapter 26. This is about 32 AD now, and we pick it up in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 26. And it says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which Jesus is speaking now, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Mark chapter 10. Let's take a look and see. Verse 45. What does that say? It says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then one of my favorite verses in the Bible, it is the soliloquy uh, passage that uh, Charles Schultz used when he wrote and, and drew the uh, comic book movie uh, published or uh, televised on television December 21st of 1965, which was the longest running program in television history, A Charlie Brown Christmas. And it was this passage that inspired Charles Schultz to, to create that particular uh, uh, cartoon, the most famous of all of his television productions. It says, chapter 2, verse 10, it says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Luke chapter 18, um, verse 31, it says, Then he, Jesus, took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. What is he talking about? talking about the 69 weeks of Daniel prophecy that the Son of Man would have to present it on the 173,880th day after the decree of Artaxerxes of Longimanus, 483 years earlier, to be presented for a four-day observation period leading to his becoming the Passover lamb of Exodus chapter 12 to atone for the sins of the original man, the first Adam, so that he can become the second man, the last Adam, and Yahweh the Savior. So, chapter 2, 22, verse 37. We'll pick that up, and it says, 
Therefore I say unto you that this that is written must be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. So Jesus is saying, look guys, I'm, I'm referring you back to the Old Testament passages that this is written must be accomplished in me. And then he quotes, uh, he was reckoned among the transgressors. That's an Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah would be reckoned, not because he was a transgressor, but he would be classed amongst the transgressors, evildoers, even though he wasn't an evildoer. Why? Jesus says, for well, the things concerning me have an end. This is pursuant to the Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 prophecy about the appearance of the Messiah. It had to be exactly on Nisan 10 of 32 AD because that was exactly 173,880 days after the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus, more than 83 years to the day, Jesus had to be presented to become the Passover lamb, to be crucified. Verse 24, uh, excuse me, verse 46 of Luke chapter 24, with the time we have left, it says, and this is right after the resurrection of Jesus, so Jesus goes to and we thank our friend from uh, with Kentucky that gave that he had Gold Cross. He even had like the little cruise with a little Jesus on it. So we had uh, a physical depiction of it. That occurs right here, and that's God bless you guys on Nissan 14 of 32 AD. After Jesus arises from the dead, we find out that he appears to his disciples and he says, verse 37 of uh, Luke chapter. Uh, uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 46, he says, And thus it was written, and thus it behooved the Christ to suffer and to rise again from the dead the third day, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name amongst all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And again, we can't, we can't talk about born again salvation, I think, without making reference to that most famous passage that characterizes it, John chapter 3, verse 16. I don't even have to look at my notes because we know that by heart, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Steve, that's how you want to get your eternal life. John 3, 16. You don't want to go to a laboratory. I don't care whether it's Professor Duna at Cal Berkeley or Professor Zhang at Harvard University, all the leading experts in human genetic engineering are eventually going to unlock the code to perpetuating the body of a human being forever by unlocking the secrets to the telomere so that the cells will replicate forever and ever and ever. But you don't want that. That could be, you know, uh, you know, associated with something called, well, we'll talk about the mark of the beast at a different time, but there's a verse in, in, in uh, Revelation chapter 13 that talks about this mark of the beast that some people believe might be some type of uh, genetic engineering insert that'll cause your DNA to change so that you won't get old anymore, so that you can live forever. People would kill to get that. And if it was given away by the government, the one world government at the time, for free, people would line up around the block 20 times over to get that. They would do anything to obtain. You wait a minute, you mean I don't have to you know, mortgage my house and, you know, uh, sacrifice my firstborn to get this? No, the government's going to give it to you for free. It's part of the new socialist program. It's going to include eternal life for everybody free of charge. People will line up for that. If that's part of what the Antichrist deception is in Revelation chapter 13, that would be a very appealing thing for people to uh, have to face as a temptation. But that's not today's teaching. Um, John chapter 6, we're getting back. Jesus became the bread of life. Uh, John chapter 6, we looked at that briefly last week. Um, in verse 51, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And that again, eternal life is going to be ours. We don't need to, uh, uh, you know, take babies from abortion clinics and study the, the, you know, the stem cells of aborted babies to try to unlock the code to life so that we can try to find out how we can obtain eternal life from a scientific manner or from a biological laboratory or through some research mechanism. We're going to get eternal life once we sign up for Jesus, according to John 3.16, once we believe on him for eternal life, we are going to obtain eternal life. But we're going to obtain it from the original 
human genetic engineer. The human genetic engineer himself, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, created the human race, and they're the guys that are going to give us the eternal life. So that's the one you want to get it from. You don't want to get it from a laboratory, because that type of eternal life might wind you up, in fact, will wind you up right here in the lake of fire. So let's go ahead and move towards our conclusion. Uh, Jesus said, whosoever eat of, of my flesh, again, continuing on the bread of life concept of John chapter 6, he says, I will raise him up at the last day. And then in John chapter 8, a couple chapters later, he makes reference to the religious elite, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the people in the temple system. And he calls them children of the devil. And he says, you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning who could not remain in the truth because there was no truth in him. And so again, Satan is now being called on the carpet. Why does Jesus call him a mass murderer? Why does he say he was a murderer from the beginning? From the beginning of what? From the beginning of the human race in the Garden of Eden when Satan in the form of the serpent tricked Eve into partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and thereby getting her to give it to her husband. He tricked her into the curse of eternal death. And so to the extent that Adam as the father of the human race gets responsibility for the death of every human that ever lived from the time of the fall in the garden all the way through 7,000 years of human history, so must Satan also get blamed for being the mastermind of the deceptive plot to trick Eve into believing that she could become a goddess by getting her husband to go along with the plan and by doing so, condemned the whole human race to death. So Satan is called a murderer from the beginning by Jesus in John chapter 8 because of what occurred between Eve and the serpent in the Garden of Eden. John chapter 10, it says, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And again, when you hear me out here on a weekly basis, I'm always at some point or other talking about the death of Jesus on our behalf. And one of my friends said, do you ever talk about anything positive, Herb? You're always talking about the death of Jesus and crucifixion and hell. That is positive because that is the only way for the human race to have a permanent escape from the condemnation that's coming. Now, we could ignore the condemnation, and I could bring a bunch of dancing girls up here to dance, and I could have them sing some, some nice spiritual songs and talk about love and happiness and peace, but that would be ignoring the reality of what's coming. And what's coming is judgment from the Lord and condemnation from the Lord and the great white throne judgment where men will be assigned into the lake of fire because of their fallen state. But they don't have to be. Hell was created for Satan and the fallen angels, not for the human race. It's not God's will that any one man spend eternity in hell. John Calvin was absolutely wrong. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Calvinism is a farce, completely wrong. God didn't create 90% of the human race to be charcoal briquettes in the lake of fire forever, and he can do it because he's sovereign, therefore who can question him on it? No, he created every human being to reign and rule with him alongside Jesus Christ throughout all of eternity. That every human being won't do that will be because as independent individuals that had breathed into them the breath of life so that they could be like God, one of us, God gave them freedom of choice, freedom of, of, of free will. So man will exercise his will to either reject the gospel of Jesus Christ or accept it. And it's not up to me or you or even God himself to decide whether or not a man accepts or rejects. He gives that into the hands of that individual person alone. And so Jesus... So each week when we're out here, I'm talking about the death of Christ some way, shape, form, or fashion. Why? Because that is the only way to atone for the sins of the original man, Adam, the first man. So, uh, Romans chapter 3, what do we find out? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter uh, 3, verse 23. Uh, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, God has sent forth to be a propitiation, a fancy legal term, through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So in other words, what is he talking about? The remission of sins that are past, that's a, a reference to every sin ever committed from Genesis chapter 3 all the 
way forward is now propitiated by the death of Jesus on the cross. Again, we had that cross depicted in Romans chapter 5, this great legal tone that Paul wrote in his letter to the Roman church. He uh, imposes and explains and extrapolates on some very important legal concepts that are very important. And he lays out in Romans chapter 5, he says, Wherefore, as by one man, who is he referring to? Adam. Sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed to all men for all have sinned. Again, that's the universal blame for every death that ever occurred is laid on the shoulders of the first man, the original Adam. And so he goes on to say, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. And here we are. Paul is laying out and calling Adam out by name. Adam, in failing to listen to the voice of his God because he listened to the voice of his wife, he gets held responsible for everyone who has ever died. It says, uh, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, meaning even if the sin that we committed wasn't as severe as Adam's betrayal of God, it still is enough to cause your death. So nobody escapes the curse of death no matter how small in their own eyes their sin is. And so again, we inherit that through Adam. It says, verse 15 of Romans 5, it says, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, Adam, the original man, Adam, many be dead, meaning the entire human race, much more the grace of God and the grace of the gift of God, which is by one man, this other man being Jesus Christ, hath God abounded unto many. In other words, what Paul is saying in a very fancy legal way is that to the extent that we can all be held accountable for Adam's sin, which means we have to endure the death penalty because of the sin of one man, Adam, that doesn't seem fair, but it's just. It's just. But because God so loved the world, he makes it just as easy to not be condemned. So he sends another man to replace Adam so that by his righteousness, which is the only man who ever lived completely righteous, we get to all inherit his righteousness by virtue of the fact that he's also related to us because he's an actual human being born in a human body, but he also happens to be God. So verse 19 of Romans 5 says, As by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, that man being Adam, the first man, so by the obedience of one, that being the second man, Jesus, many shall be made righteous. So Jesus cancels out the power of Adam's sin, we find out in Romans 5. In Romans 8, it says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Not only they, but we ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, that is to say, the redemption of our body. Steve, do you groan waiting for the redemption of your body? I'd say so. I, I, I groan a, a whole bunch. I, I was groaning this morning pretty good. So we're going to finish up here. We've got just a few more minutes left. But uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul writes a letter to the Corinthian church, and he says, for a man indeed not ought cover his head. This is important. This relates back to what happened in the garden. So that you'll see that I'm not kind of making all this up. Like Herb and this thing about feminism, I don't know. He's kind of stretching it there. Well, let's see. Paul says to the Corinthian church, and he wrote this about 2,000 years ago. Verse 7 of uh, 1 Corinthians 11, for those of you following along at home, it says, For a man indeed ought not cover his head, for as much as he is the image and the glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. What's that relating to? Genesis chapter 2, verses 21, 2, and 3, where the woman came from out of the rib of the man. And then we find out, uh, you know, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul goes on and extrapolates further, and he says this. He says, For Adam was formed first, then Eve was formed. So it was formed first, Adam, Adam was formed first, and then Eve was formed from out of his rib. Verse 14, and Adam, this is the key verse here, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, and Adam was not deceived. I've had this debate with people. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. What is he talking about? In the Garden of Eden, when the fall occurred, the serpent deceived the woman 
with goddesshood and the origins of feminism and the ability to obtain occultic knowledge to become a god woman. Adam wasn't part of that whole conversation and he wasn't deceived. He simply decided to do it to make his wife happy. So his sin and transgression was even greater because he wasn't even tricked to do it. He willingly chose to make a value decision. Gee, I love God, but I love my wife more because she's, man, she's, she's hot. She cooks me breakfast. She walks in the park with me, holds my hand, gives me a foot massage, you know, hugs me and tells me I'm a beautiful guy. So he loved his wife more than God, which wasn't the way God intended things to be. And so we find out then, Paul is making clear, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So therefore, now the death responsibility falls to Adam. So now in Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, the first letter, chapter 15, we see verse 22 lays out clearly the principle that I've been really trying to get out to you guys all day. It says, for as in Adam all die, what's he talking about? Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. Again, referring, referring to uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, John chapter 10, verse 11. Verse 45 of 1 Corinthians 15 says, And so it was written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening or life-giving spirit. Howbeit that it was not the first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards comes that which is spiritual. And it's like, well, what's he talking about? And then in verse 47, it goes on to say, the first man is of the earth, earthy. He's talking about Adam. That's what the term Adam really means, reddish, earthy man. The first man is of the earth, but the second man is the Lord from heaven. That's where we get the title of today's talk. The second man, the last Adam, is Jesus Christ. Verse 45 says, so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam is Jesus. And he becomes a spirit that can give life even to those that were dead. Eternal life is spiritual. That will take place in a physical body, but your physical body isn't eternal. It's the soul that lives inside of you that needs to be born again so that it can live forever. Jesus becomes a quickening or life-giving spirit, unlike the first Adam who caused death to come into all men. And so, verse 48, it says, as we conclude, and as is the earthy, which is Adam, such are they that are earthy, the human race, that's us. And as is the heavenly, such are they that are heavenly. That is to say, us that are born again. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, the first man, Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Who's he talking about? The second man, the last Adam, Jesus Christ. So again, I'm gonna conclude it now. Hebrews chapter two, Paul says in verse 14, for as much then as the children are the partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same and became, what, the same, human, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Satan basically imprisons the entire human race because of his deceptive intrigue in the Garden of Eden some 4,000 years ago. And as a result of that intrigue, paradise is lost. But the paradise lost by Satan's intrigue and tricking Eve in the Garden of Eden is undone by who? Not the first man, Adam, who condemns the whole human race, but by the second man, who Paul calls the last Adam, Jesus Christ, who will again return to us the opportunity to live forever as part of the kingdom of heaven. And we'll end it with Revelation chapter 22, as it says, and he showed me a pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. 
And in the midst of the street of it, talking about the New Jerusalem, the pivot right here, and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life. Where do we hear about that? In the Garden of Eden. That's why they were kicked out, so they couldn't take of it and eat and live forever in a fallen state. They got kicked out. But guess what? Paradise Lost is now restored. Some 7,000 years later, now we can freely have access to this tree of life, which bear 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, meaning all ethnic groups on earth will also be in the kingdom of heaven with God. It's not based upon ethnicity, it's based upon the blood of Jesus and whether or not you're born again. And there shall be no more curse. Which curse? The curse of Adam's sin will be removed from off of our shoulders at long last when Jesus comes back the second time. And it says, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And we'll be all his servants, and it'll be great. And this is the key verse, and they shall see his face. Those of us that are born again, we're going to eventually see God the Father face to face. And his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. And guess what, Steve? Here it is. And they, us, the believers, shall reign forever and ever. The end of the beginning, because the end never comes. It'll be forever and ever and ever. So our destiny as human beings, as part of the human race, was always to do what? to reign and rule with Jesus Christ forever. So even before man was placed in the Garden of Eden here some 4,000 years ago, it was planned that 7,000 years later, that same man, the descendants of Adam, the first man, the original man Adam, the descendants thereof, us, the human race, were destined to reign and rule with Jesus Christ in the presence of God the Father forever and ever. And that is in the final chapter in the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. So therefore we know it's true, all because the curse of the first man, the original Adam, was reversed and canceled out by the blood of the second man, the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And so with that, Steve, close up in a brief word of prayer and we would hope that the Lord will come soon. So thank you guys for your attention, and we'll see you guys next week as we continue with Southeast Gospel Ministries. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to come out and be part of the mission. Lord, we thank you most for your son, Jesus Christ. The second man, as Herb Street so, so detailed about today, Lord. I just pray that we'll, we'll take the time that we spent hearing the word today, go out, be doers of the word that we hear, Lord, and, 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 and partake in the mission. And uh, Lord, again, we thank you for the opportunity to be part of your word, part of your ministry. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.